Yeah, we're getting messages that there is sand now, so we're back. So welcome again to What Does It Mean to Be Jewish Today, lesson number six. And um, before we go, and, and we are going to uh, focus on answering your questions today. And before we do, we just want to remind you that we're at a point where we're talking about the Jews being different from other nations because of the role that they have and the sense that they're different exists in everyone, non-Jews and Jews alike. Mm -hmm. So, as usual, the chat's open, and we'll be taking your questions there. And let's begin with a okay. review of do, last Do time. they have it? Do they... Yes, sound is working. I have sound now. Okay, good. Okay, so let's begin with your questions. Um, from last week, right? <clears throat> These are from last week, and also questions that students um, sent um, during the week mm -hmm. and after the lesson yes, um, last week. Uh, some of them already relate to this week's chapter, I think. Um, but in any case, we're going to answer all of them. Okay, today we're focusing on, on chapter number six in the book. Okay, so let's, let's get into it. Why is there so much hate against Israel slash Jews? If it's the people who contribute the most to the progress development of the world, yes, Nobel Prizes, inventions, high tech, etc. Um, that's been discussed quite often. The problem is that it's discussed mainly by Jews. Jews are wondering why is there so much hatred toward us if we are giving humanity so much? We're giving humanity um, such great scientists in medicine and in physics and in high tech. And uh, let's not forget culture with all the Jewish actors and filmmakers and um, owners of uh, film of, of the, the big studios in Hollywood. Um, producers, and let's not forget writers, and let's not forget uh, what else do we we have? We have tons. Um, none of it matters. None of it matters. Why? Because all of these Nobel Prizes and all of these great contributions do not make people happier. They may make them culturally richer they may make their lives easier if we're talking about technology and all that and it may make them live longer but for what what do they get out of a longer life happiness it doesn't give them the Jews have a specific role to play and it's not to play in a movie. It's not a role to play in medicine or science or culture or you name it. It's in uniting the human race. The guy who wrote uh, the complaint about the Jews feeling superior wrote it after he read the book. And um, he said, uh, he wrote to Dr. Lightman, he said, uh, now I know you, 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 you're arrogant, um, and it's a shame because I like your other books. It, it's not about arrogance. It's about something that you, you know, uh, if everybody tells you you're different, then you've got to go and check how you're different. And if you, if you look at what's happening today, you know the Jews are being singled out all over the world. Just yesterday or the day before, there was another uh, demonstration on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan uh, outside a Jewish uh, jewelry store uh, against the Jews uh, controlling the finance and, and whatnot. Um, and, and saying basically, don't buy from Jews. Okay? So Jews are being singled out everywhere and for every reason. If you read number, if you read the chapter number six, 
then you can see what uh, Eric Hoffer wrote, what Martin Luther King wrote. Um, there's a debate on whether or not he actually wrote this letter to a friend or not. But in any case, even those who, who, who say he didn't write it um, do say that 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 the views he um, he expresses in this letter are authentic, um, and you can see that anti-Semitism in every generation, in every period of human development, um, takes on different robes, if you will, but it's always the same thing. And even now you can see how anti-Zionism changes into anti-Semitism very easily. Because underneath it all, it's the Jews having to do what they have to do. And they're not doing it. So people blame the Jews for whatever reason. And, and the reason is, is something, uh, we're going to read it. Um, so yes, so all of these prizes, Nobel Prizes and whatnot, the Jews win, make no difference. Unless the Jews do what they have to do, which is unite. And pass on that in order to pass on that unity to the rest of the world, the world will keep hating them. In the very least, it will keep excluding them. And in the end, it'll turn into hatred. So that's what we gotta do. Or right, another question. Why did you I'm sorry, why did you first call the Jews pariahs and then medics of the world? Because it's both. It is both. As long as Jews are not medics of the world, they will keep being regarded as pariahs. Okay? They will keep being singled out and excluded and excommunicated and rejected by the world as long as they do not function as medics. Okay, do you think that if Israel doesn't exist, there will be no anti-Semitism? Come on. There has been anti-Semitism for official anti-Semitism for hundreds of years, um, and Israel has existed since 1948. How many years is that? Sixty something? Yeah, sixty-six or so. Um, anti-Semitism is there. It's going to be here, and it's going to stay until we do what we have to do. So there is no connection between. Anti-Semitism and and the existence or non-existence of the state of Israel it was very not. Uh, I heard someone said before there was a state of Israel, anti-Semites say, "Go to Palestine, go to Israel, go away from here, go to go to your country." Now that there is the state of Israel, people say, "Get out of Israel, go to wherever you came from." So, and it's because it's because people hate. Basically, Israel, the Jews, they have this gut feeling that Jews are causing all the problems in the world. And it's true, because all the problems in the world derive from the lack of, of unity between us. It's because we're all so self-centered, we can't control ourselves, and we're destroying our own societies. And the people with the solution to that um, narcissism, to that self-centeredness, is the Jews. They don't know it, but it exists within them. So they have to um, rekindle that sense of unity. They have to learn how to unite again and then pass it on. It's as simple as that. Um, another question, what is redemption? Redemption was mentioned several times in the book and I suppose it merits an answer. Um, people think of redemption in religious terms, in terms of God coming down and, and, and delivering all of us uh, from what? There is no God sitting up there behind the moon, behind the solar system, above, I don't know, the Milky Way, somewhere out there in space. There is no such thing. There is a very simple principle that reality functions through the 
interaction of two forces, if you will, two, it's not even forces, it's, it's two trends, two tendencies, two vectors, if you will. One is toward receiving, the other is toward giving. And if you only, and, and, and all of nature, all of reality, ha- has those two vectors intertwined, and because there's no free choice, nature balances itself out. So it exists. And all animals, all plants, everything in reality feels it and functions accordingly. It's the law of life. Humans are the exception. We've been given only a sensation that we want. That's all we are. We are... Why is it so easy, why is it so easy to, 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 to turn us into uh, these voracious uh, consumers that devour everything we, 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 we see, especially in others? It's because we are born with this tendency to only want to receive. We don't have the sensation that there are two forces at play here and that everything is one system. Why is that? Because when you when you have that awareness, then you become aware of the whole system. And people, the human race, are intended to attain that, to perceive that, to to grasp the um, the balance, the interaction, the existence of those two forces, those two vectors, and how they interact. And we need all of us to come to a point where we have complete perception of it. And therefore, we know how everything works. The the ultimate goal of humanity is to become like the Creator, omniscient. So the only way to do it is to have us born ignorant of it and develop that awareness by ourselves. And then we know that everything works this way. Just like we developed the radio, which receives the radio waves. And then we know what's around us. So we got to develop the tool that perceives what's around us. And the way to develop it is by developing those two vectors within us. So we've got plenty of the desire to receive already. Now we have to develop the other desire, the, the, the other vector to give. We do that by working on our unity. That's what Abraham discovered. That's what he was trying to teach. Um, it's been phrased in different ways throughout the generations, but it's always about the same thing. You develop unity, you perceive the vector of unity, the vector of giving in reality, then you perceive the whole reality, then you become like the Creator, etc., etc. It's called by different names in Hebrew, dvekut, adhesion, equivalence of form, whatever. You do it through uniting. And that's the secret. That's the big secret. Now, we told you. It's not not a secret anymore. That's the big secret of the Jews, and that is what they have to tell the world. Yes? I just wanted to add to that. It's a secret, but really, if you look at nature, and if you look at development for thousands, Mm -hmm. hundreds, even millions of years, then you can see it's not really such a secret. Because there have always been these two forces in nature. All the development comes from these plus and minus forces. If you look at an atom, and the electrons, and the protons, if you look... Pretty much anything, there's always these two forces that lead to development. Right. And what you've basically been saying is that we have this one force, which is, you know, greatly increased, that ego, that desire to consume, not just consume uh, material goods, but just to consume everything, even people, even emotions, everything we want to consume. And, um, not just a great shot looking at you. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, um... So, this this adding this unity, adding this this additional force of a plus, it's basically just balancing out the system. 
So, like we talked about, gravity is a law. And whether you like it or not, if you walk off a roof, you'll fall and you'll crash. And what we're doing here is we're simply beginning to understand that this, this tendency of nature and how if, if we begin to adapt to that, if we begin to add unity or try to increase our desire for it, try to create an environment that supports this unity, we're simply balancing out these two forces in nature. And then, like everything, if you're going with the force of nature, then you're bound to succeed. That, that, that's the thing. That, that it's very true what God is saying because when you look around, you, you, know, you know, yin and yang, like it's been known for ages that these two forces exist. What we don't know is how we can develop this force, this vector within us. We are consuming animals and we're only animal we're the only animal that consumes more than it needs and that is basically focused on consuming all other creatures in nature just take what they need in order to survive period and not an ounce more than that we consume everything we see around us the more the better and it's not so so what can replace it? If we stop receiving, we're going to be miserable because it's against our nature. So what we have to do is to develop another nature that rejoices not in just devouring, but in seeing, not just in seeing, but in being like the whole of nature. That enjoys it, that sees it as the purpose of life. And then it replaces many of the cravings we have today. We're still going to want to eat and, and you know, have a normal life, of course. <clears throat> but But we're also going to have a goal. Not just a goal, but... Um, something to attain that is far, far greater and better and richer than anything we can imagine right now. So, the great secret of the Jews wasn't that reality functions on two vectors. It's that they knew how to become like that. They knew how to develop themselves into being like that. And this is what people need. Because we can see that we're the only element that doesn't work this way, and we're the only, only element that's destroying its own habitat. Which in our case today is not like the Babylonians uh, four or five thousand years ago. In our case, it's the whole planet. If we keep being who we are, we are going to destroy the entire planet in the sense that we will make it inhabitable to ourselves. So... It's a pretty urgent matter now. Um, so we can't expect anti-Semitism to decline until we start actually providing um, a method for relinquishing self-centeredness and nurturing... I don't know if altruism is, is the right word, but, but balanced existence in the sense that we ourselves become balanced. Uh, do we go on to other questions, or uh, is there anything no, urgent here? No, I think we can continue with the okay. lineup. I'm pleased to read that a lot of people think positively about Jews. Okay, I guess this is Jew writing it. But that was a long time ago, because nowadays it's the opposite. Yep. When I read the news, how do you explain such admiration and such hatred together? And how did it become so violent in the 21st century? Well, mm, first of all, it's been violent for uh, quite a few centuries. <clears throat> if you read Jewish history, um, it's a history basically of, uh, of escaping from one place to another. Uh, due to violence. Um, well, I think we, in one of the um, 
slides today, we're going to mention Petlua, a Ukrainian uh, uh, leader, for example, just something probably many don't know about. Um, in the 19th century, within a, about two years or so, um, he, he was a Kozak leader. Afterwards, he was the, um, the, the prime minister or president of, of the Ukraine or something. A Ukrainian leader. And under his leadership, um, 800, more than 800 pogroms took place in the Ukraine alone, in which more than 150,000 Jews were murdered. So it's not like violence began today. And, and I'm specifically mentioning him in order to avoid mentioning the obvious uh, um, Inquisition in, in Spain and the Holocaust and all that. The Jews have a history of being persecuted and, and, and destroyed and murdered wherever they go. First they are welcome, and then they provide, uh, they, 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 they help um, uh, improve the economy, and then they are accused for overtaking the economy, and then they are persecuted, and then they are murdered, and then they run away to another place. What does it all give us, though? These persecutions cause Jews to become more and more dispersed throughout the world. And this dispersion, subconsciously, also disperses the idea that Jews represent even when they don't know it. And the idea is that unity is a solution to the problems. Now, because for the past 2,000 years, Jews do not know the meaning of unity, meaning the, 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 the secret that Abraham had and taught, and his um, posterity taught to, to, to the Israeli people for, what, 1,500 years or so, even more, um, until they lost it completely because the ego grew to a point where they couldn't maintain unity anymore. But that root exists in the Jews still. So wherever they go, they pass it around. What does it do? It subconsciously prepares the people for the notion that unity is the solution. And this quality of unity Many people actually sensed it. Um, you know what? Let's 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 go to um, to let, let's look at some of the slides. I intended to use them during the lesson, but let's um, let's look at slide number six. I think. Let me check it out first. The power of unity. Um. No. No. Oh, yes, yes. Look at slide number six. Look at what um, um, Winston Churchill, the, the uh, British Prime Minister during uh, World War II, um, had a thing about the Jews. He was, he was very curious about them. And he look what he noticed about them. Um, I'm reading slide number six. In Churchill and the Jews, author Martin Gilbert quotes Churchill. The Jews were a lucky community because they had that corporate spirit, the spirit of their race and faith, that personal and special power which they possessed would enable them to bring vitality into their institutions which nothing else would ever give. So, and and if you want to take it from the negative angle, you have Henry Ford talking about, not Henry Ford, Hitler talking about unity of the Jews when they are in trouble, and many people talked about that. Um, even we Jews talk about how, how come we only unite when we're in trouble. And that's because we are um, we are broken in the sense that we, that sense of, of, of the importance of unity, that trait that keeps us united, the quality that keeps us united is broken within us, doesn't exist within us, it's not working. 
Okay? What is working is the sense of unity that we use in order to uh, help ourselves. And that invokes hatred and antagonism and eventually anti-Semitism. So we don't need to relinquish unity. On the contrary, we need to pass it on, to develop it in ourselves to the point where we use unity, not for ourselves, but in order to pass it on to everyone else. That's when things will change. Um, Let's look at what Henry Ford wrote. Let's look at two slides, or maybe just slide number uh, five, or four and five. Let me just see for a sec. Okay, let's, let's, let's check out um, slide number four. Henry Ford, um, the founder of Ford Motor Companies, uh, was a great industrialist. Um, he also invented this terrible thing called the assembly line. Um, <clears throat> and he did a great deal of good to the American industry, and actually to industries uh, elsewhere in the world as well. And he hated Jews. Um, And he wrote a book called The International Jew, The World's Foremost Problem. And in it he explains why the Jews are the world's foremost problem. But Henry Ford uh, was a smart fellow. Um, and he didn't just hate the Jews. He explained why. And you do want to look at some of his scrutinies, which are very profound, and give you something to think about, and see that he wasn't just hating the Jews. He was basically trying to convey a message that if Jews do what they should, they will not be hated they will be admired. And he actually, he writes it in several places in the book. Um, so, so let's take a, a look at, at, at two of these ex- excerpts. Okay, let's look at slide number four again. Um, so in, in this book, The International Jew, The World's Foremost Problem, he writes, It is not forgotten that certain promises were made to them, to the Jews, regarding their position in the world. And it is held that these prophecies will be fulfilled The future of the Jew is intimately bound up with the future of the planet. And the Christian church, in large part, sees a restoration of the chosen people yet to come. If the mass of the Jews knew how understandingly and sympathetically all the prophecies concerning them are being studied in the church, and the faith that exists that these prophecies will find fulfillment and that they will result in great Jewish service to society at large, they would probably regard the church with another mind. So he's basically telling us, just do what you have to do, and we will embrace you. How? It doesn't get more obvious than that. Let's look at another one, slide number five. Earlier in the book, Ford writes, The whole prophetic purpose with reference to Israel seems to have been a moral moral enlightenment of the world through its its agency. In other words, the Jews have the role of of providing moral enlightenment. And this is not said by a Jew, but by an anti-Semite. And in another place, he adds, society has a large claim against the Jew, that he begin to fulfill what, in a sense, his exclusiveness has never yet enabled him to fulfill, which is what? The ancient prophecy that through him all the nations of the earth should be blessed. Now you ask about Jewish arrogance. We just have to face it and start working. There's nothing to be arrogant about. On the contrary, there's a lot to be ashamed about. 
that we've been neglecting our role for centuries. And now it's time to get going. Um, <clears throat> if you have any questions on that, please do ask them now in the chat, and we will stop and answer. In the meantime, let's continue. There are questions if you want to... Oh, uh, yeah, okay. Okay, so we have a question from Sylvia from Guatemala. So Sylvia is asking, how do we put into practice the law of bestowal that is contrary to our inner self? Is unity like a lab where you can practice giving, practice bestowal? Unity is, 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 is not a lab in itself. It's the purpose but you you create it first of all what we're doing now is already changing you if it makes you ask questions it is already changing you you don't need to create something out of nothing the vector of unity the positive vector that the one that emits rather than attracts exists in reality we just need to tap into it because the minute you start thinking about it, it starts influencing you. It, you know what? Let's, let's, let's use a, a medical example or physical example. Um, in our brains, there's something called neuro, uh, uh, mirror neurons. What, are the, what do they do? Nothing. But when you look at someone doing something, these neurons seemingly do the same thing with that other person. So, when you want to do the same thing, you then already have at least some knowledge of how to do it. Because in your brain at least part of your brain, has already done it. Now it's just projected into the, into the organs that actually do it. This is how we learn from others. Similarly, the minute you start thinking about giving, about uniting, you, you start developing in you the mechanism that makes you like that. This wasn't the perfect example, but whatever. No, add to that, even, you can look at it, like, if you look at the entire world, like one system, and that's already evident today, that everything is interconnected. There is no single part of the world that's completely uh, isolated. Yeah, we talked about the pencil in one of the yeah, previous yeah. lessons. Exactly, that a pencil has to be, no one knows how to make a pencil for right. a single person <laughs> in the world. Um, actually, when I talk, never mind. Anyway, <laughs> no, just remind me of some other stuff. Anyway, if you're looking at the entire world as a system, and that each and every one of us is a part of this system, then it makes a lot of sense because there are questions here: How do we do this in practice? How can we change the world and influence the world? And these questions make sense because, for example, Sylvia is only one person, and maybe a few other people here. But if you think of us as an entire system, every part of the system that begins to adapt itself to this new direction nature is taking that begins to, to add this, this element of unity, or however you want to call it, then obviously it's immediately influencing the entire system. It's not just changing. So Sylvia, if you begin to start getting into that mindset, if you begat, begin to start understanding that unity is really the solution, you're not just changing yourself, you're influencing the entire system, because everything is interconnected. So you might be influencing the other side of the world, for all we know it, and not only individual connections, but the entire system itself is like being upgraded. I'd like to add uh, something for the homework. I'm not sure you can do it, but if you can, uh, check this out. Get some of your friends together. Three, four, five of your friends together. Get together for an evening. Have some coffee. Something nice to eat. Um, have a beer or whatever. You know, good feeling. Friendly feeling. And then 
But this is something you guys have to have to work out. Okay. I'm going to give you uh, a rough line out, like a basic layout of 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 what you're going to do in this meeting. And then you tell them, um, we are here, or maybe you can tell them on the phone or whatever, we are here in order to uh, talk about something. Choose something, uh, not very controversial, but something that you're going to have diverse views about. And you're going to tell them this. We're going to talk about this, this topic now. But we're going to do it following a few very simple rules. A. Um, no one speaks. Uh, no one interjects with another person's words. In other words, if you are speaking, no one else is allowed to speak at the same time. Um, when we practice these things, we usually have something called attention object, like a pencil or whatever you're holding something. And that means you're the speaker. No one else is allowed to speak at that time. Everyone else is obligated. Everyone else must listen to you. Okay? But you also can't take all the time in the world, you know? Take up to a minute to talk and then pass it on to someone else. Um, that's one. Two, when you speak, you do not use any negation of someone else's words. You do not disagree. Even if you do internally, and you probably will, because the ego tells you you're right and they're wrong. But you don't say it. You're forbidden to say it. You can only add. You add another angle, another line of thought. Um, or maybe you tap into the other person's idea, and you add to that idea. You develop it. So that's what you are allowed to do. You're not allowed to disagree. Um, what else? Not talking at the same time. Not talking too long. Only adding. Um, that's basically it. That's all it takes. And after, say, half an hour or an hour, stop for a minute and see where you are, how you felt at the beginning, and how you feel now, after, say, half an hour. What has been created between you? That's, that's the idea. This exercise, we, we call it the workshop, creates something new. It's why? Because it's not your own view anymore. Because you couldn't disagree with someone else. You couldn't make your view triumph over, uh, overtake all the other views. Um, but instead, you will have created something that's common to all of you. That you all, not just agree with, but embrace. That didn't come from any specific person. That something is the unity that we're looking for. If you do that and it worked, you will not be able to hate any of the participants in, 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 the, in the workshop. We've done that hundreds of times with people who are not... I was... I told you not to take something too controversial. We've done that with enemies, with Jews and Arabs, with um, people who've been in, in, in conflict for years, in neighborhoods where, pe where people could not uh, get along uh, and the neighborhood was, was in ruins. And in each and every time, People came out of there after an hour of discussing, saying beautiful things about all the other people in the workshop. They they started WhatsApp groups and, and Facebook groups and 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 
and took each other's phones and everything, and they could not stand each other before that. They vehemently hated each other before that. So it's very simple, and it works. What I'd like you to do is try it out, <clears throat> those of you who can, and write to us. Where should they write? They should write in... Uh, I'll tell you in a second. Okay. Write to us and tell us um, how, how it went. And we're going to read it here next week. Okay? They can write to us on the Facebook group, Bundle of Reads. Or, after the lesson, we're going to send an email that they can reply to with questions and anything else, so they can write it there. Okay, good. Good. Okay, so either on Facebook or reply to the email. Um, let's go to another question. Yeah, we are not going to get into the lesson today. We're just going to answer questions. Yeah, now just while I, before I post the next question, what you were describing, that round table, actually has been found in research a few years ago in MIT that this is something that creates... Uh, collective intelligence. We'll forgive the guys because they just both had babies, so. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> sleep deprived. Pavel, Pavel if you, you can show really Gilad, a... he's he's trying to say something, and people we do want to see do want to see him. <laughs> okay. Assuming okay. Keep talking, too. Gilad. Yes, okay. and. Uh, and so anyway. You can move over here if oh, you there want. We go. <laughs> Thank so you. it was found that there is a factor called collective intelligence, and this factor is found in a group of people who are together. And the amazing thing is that this collective intelligence is not correlated with the average intelligence of the group. In other words, if you have a group of people that are very smart, with very high average of IQ, it doesn't necessarily mean that they'll be a smart group. If you have people of of average IQ... Probably, probably because of their egos. Exactly. So the research found that what does make a group smart isn't, the, isn't their, the individual IQ in the group, but it's actually how sensitive they are to each other. It's called social, social sensitivity. They also found that equal distribution of speech in that group is what makes a group smart. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting to see that here again, you can be uh, socially sensitive in a group, and that doesn't just influence your interaction with every other person in the group. It actually raises the entire collective intelligence of the group itself. And not only being um, one of the great So elements, the group becomes like its own entity. The group becomes its own entity. They don't really know how it works. They don't, they, there's no real explanation to how there is a factor that is not related to the individuals of the group, but it's only related to the group itself with its mm -hmm. dynamics, with, its, with everything included in it. But they just know that it does work that way. And it's just another example of... Well, first of all, it's an example of how the workshop and those rules of the workshop is something that really creates this positive social atmosphere. And second, it's another example of how if I change my approach, if I change my attitude, I'm influencing the entire system. I'm boosting the levels of the entire system as well. Okay. So, And that's another important point, um, that you don't need to, to suppress your opinion. You don't need to, to, to adopt someone else's view. It's not, it's, there's no struggle here. The only struggle is um, not to say that you disagree, but do add your own. So you remain who you are. That's very important. You don't cancel yourself out. Because that will not work. Yeah, so not in the long run, at least. We're aiming for unity, not for uniformity. Or, or exactly. We're not trying to make people the same. The idea is not to make you all the same. The idea is not to, to oppress your minds or your views or who you are. On the contrary, your difference, your uniqueness is what you contribute to the group. The more, dif the more diverse the group is, the richer and, and, and more qualitative is the unity that they produce. Let me throw in another research. Sorry, I'm, I'm writing my thesis now, so I'm all saturated with a million <laughs> okay. things. So that reminded now me... Now go ahead, we're all benefiting from it. Uh, a meta-analysis by Johnson & Johnson, two researchers of, in, from the field of education. Yeah. They researched um, different methods of, of, of learning for the last like, 60 years, 
and they found that collaborative learning is always more beneficial and gives better results than individualistic learning or competitive learning. It is actually, on the one hand, it makes sense. On the other hand, if you look at all the schooling systems, they're still aiming at competitive strategies, and that's completely off. They're, they're found to be... Um, we might think that you know being competitive, it, it gives motivation and so on, and to some extent it does, but collaborative learning, and that's exactly what you were saying, it's shown to not only produce higher marks and better scores and better learning habits and so on. By far, I know this research. By far. Yes. But, but it, also, it, it also gives uh, um, a better, a higher confidence for mm-hmm. the person who's participating. And it also... What's and it word? goes beyond, beyond the school hours and they talk about how it affects hours, a person's exactly. personal li- a student's personal life and everything. He's it becomes more confident. He's, yeah. he's exactly, his social life as well. Mm-hmm. And also, r- regarding what you said, that a person, fi- it's not that he cancels himself out. On the contrary, and that's what that research found, that when a person is in a collaborative study, right. then he has much more confidence to be himself, to express himself. And he's, he's less, um, he, his resilience rises. He's less likely to conform to the group and kind of cancel his own uniqueness. So only in a collaborative environment is where a person can really feel free to become himself. Yeah, Johnson, Johnson, you, you, you do want to check it out. It's called Social Interdependence Theory. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot, uh, there's an ex- extensive mention of that research uh, mm-hmm. that they did in Self-Interest versus Altruism, Dr. Lightman's uh, mm-hmm. book from 2009, I think, um, or 2011, whatever. Um, he does mention it there. Um, and, and it's just another proof. They they researched um, over a thousand. Uh, they went over a thousand re- researchers' papers um, done over a hundred years. Uh, so um, so it's been proven scientifically. So why don't we use it? We don't use it. We don't use it. I think. Well, actually, that's what the course is about to some extent. We're we're trying to figure out why we're not using it. But I think that naturally. We can see that we have this kind of desire in us, this call it a survival instinct, or you can call it an ego, or you can call it that very same thing that led the people in Mesopotamia to start dispersing and separating. And it's pushing us, on on the one hand, away from each other. And it's leading to development of of what what we're seeing today that's leading to complete chaos. The consumerism... Uh, narcissism that's leading to depression and we're seeing that these systems aren't working so why aren't we doing it because we don't have an environment that constantly reminds us because we have that automatic survival instinct that kind of okay you know what there's you there's me yeah but you know all animals have a survival instinct and they're not like that Mm -hmm. so i think that takes us back to the lesson before that when you know maybe you can revise that again about those desires that we have in us, about the, the, the ego. The idea is, is, as I said in the beginning, we're born with only one vector to take for ourselves, and the more the better. And another problem is that we're always envious of the other person. Right? We talked about it. What's, 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 what's the point of having a uh, I don't know, millions in the bank, if you, if you cannot talk about it or if you cannot show it to other people. If nobody knows you're rich, what's the point of being rich? The whole point of wealth is, is to, to, be, to feel superior to others. We have this inclination within us to not just provide for our sustenance, but to to satisfy our desire for superiority. It's a good thing because human the human race is intended to be superior. It is intended to be superior over the whole of nature. But how? By becoming consciously aware of how nature works and not just doing it instinctively by denying us the other vector the awareness of the other vector it forces us 
nature forces us to develop that awareness within us. That nature, it's, it's like it's telling us to create ourselves. <clears throat> to create that part in, in ourselves that's missing and thus acquiring the understanding of how the whole of nature works. And when you do that, you know how to run yourself and how to run reality and how to stop the chaos from happening. And then you become like the Creator. That's the whole point. Again, going back to that. And it's not a mystical thing. It's a very down-to-earth, practical perception that a person gets. It's like his whole being um, expands and perceives the whole of reality all at once. But how do you do that? Precisely by not annulling your uniqueness, going above it, just like you do in a workshop. That's why it's, it's such an important exercise. Um, so, so that's how you get to it. And this is why um, all those theories that have been known for a hundred years now, at least, that, that working together works better than working alone, that's why we can't see it, not at school, not in most of our workplaces, even when people collaborate, they still have this negative competition. Why? Because within us, we haven't developed that other nature that we must. And again, the Jews have to lead the way toward it because within them there is this already seed uh, of previous experience of that. So they have to kind of water it and and make it grow, and spread the unity all over the world. And how do we do it? How do we water it? By creating an environment, just as Gilad said. Mm -hmm. An environment that nurtures it, that supports it. Um, the, the right environment is the water and the sun and the fertilizers that this seed needs. And we have to create it, otherwise it won't be rekindled. I just want to add to that, you were saying that when a person is born, he has this one vector of maximum pleasure for himself, to receive as much as he can. No. <laughs> uh, just, just for a sec. Pavel, if you can, uh, I don't know what you're focusing on, but please focus on us um, as a service to our viewers, so that when Gilad speaks, they can actually see who's talking. Thank you. So yeah, so you're saying that when a child is born, they have this one vector of basically receiving maximum for themselves. And that's true, and as we spoke about in the previous lessons, that's true on the human level. But if you're looking at the animal level of the person, meaning this body, which is no different than any other animal, you know, if you learn, um, if you look at it, different animals, they have different biological structures, and we're the same. We have a slightly different structure, but if you look at an ape, we're pretty much the same. And on that level, we already have this preparation to, to connect. So, uh, so as you said, if we create these positive environments and so on, on the one hand, our human level has maybe a resistance of it. I don't want to connect to anyone. I don't want to unite. On the other hand, our body, when we do it, it feels good. Or the, you know, releases um, oxytocin, the love hormone. It has a whole, a whole series of positive effects the moment we do create these positive connections. So it's like the system is already prepared for that to happen and it only depends on us on the human level to start creating this and, and making it actually happen. That, that, that's very important because it means that even us humans are almost entirely ready for connection. All that's missing is the transformation of the human part in us. Because the human part in us is the one that doesn't want to connect. Everything else about nature and about us is ready for connection, except our desire for it. Um, do I go on to another question? Yes. Oh, from uh, there or from here? Whatever. Just uh, maybe this is something good to address, maybe even in short. Um, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right. Tauni from Texas is saying, I hope the understanding of Israel is accomplished. 
And that Jew is not just a religion or an ethic. Even though we've spoken about it many times, maybe it's good just to remind that again. Viewers maybe have joined us now, people are just watching this video. Yeah, um, yeah, first of all, if you haven't watched previous lessons, then uh, you do want to watch it. As we said, Israel, um, the internal meaning of Israel, has nothing to do with the physical body or with um, being born to a Jewish family or even being born in Israel. It has to do with a specific, not even a desire, but again, a vector, a direction in which you are developing. Israel comes from two words, yesha, ked, straight to the Creator. When a person wants to reach the Creator, in other words, when a person wants to develop both vectors of life and perceive the whole of reality, that person is Israel. It may be a Muslim, or a Christian, or a Jew, or a Buddhist, or whatever. And you may, may be born in Israel, or in the U.S., or in um, Iran, wherever. You're Israel. On the outside, you can continue doing what you were doing before. And you can continue belonging to whatever religion you were born to. Because religion has its own role. Cultural role, social role, um, and it keeps society in order. But internally, when you have that desire, you are Israel. Okay? Yeah. Let's go to another question. Um, I have one here if you want. Let me just see. I'm just going to choose. I'm just going to choose one here. One more here. Mm -hmm. Jews always consider themselves superior. Now we've done that. Why? Okay, let's go to the last one. Why Jewish? Why the Jewish people are so proud of being Jewish? but try to escape their mission, like Jonah the prophet. Um, well, I don't know. First of all, speaking for myself, I was never proud of being, uh, being Jewish. Um, and there's nothing to be proud about. And there is no room for any pride or shame or anything. It's a system. Let's look at it as a system. We are all parts of a system. We've got to function like the uh, properly working parts of a machine. And just like parts of a machine don't feel superior, uh, even if it's the CPU of a computer, the CPU doesn't feel superior to the memory, for example, um, then, you know, we just have to do what we have to do. Um, why do they try to escape their mission? That's a different question. They try because uh, it's uncomfortable because they're not aware of the mission that they have because that seed has not sprung yet. Um, so for many reasons, uh, either because they're simply oblivious to it, that they have no idea that this is what it means to be a light for the nations. And even those who have an idea say... Uh, you know, after uh, Dr. Lightman wrote his um, New York Times article, he got this one message from uh, from a Jew saying, what you're saying is true, and I know you are right, but you cannot say it. No, no, people aren't ready for it. You can't say the truth. You have to. You have to. The world is at a stage where it needs to hear the truth. It's hard to accept. It's uncomfortable. We don't have any other choices. We are going to ruin our planet pretty soon if we don't hurry up and do what we have to do. Yeah, let's let's see what you got there. Okay, so Heidi from South Carolina, she feels a bit hurt. 
Not from us, that? but from Henry Ford's words. And she says the following. She said, Why do Jewish people feel ashamed for the hateful philosophy of Henry Ford? I'm so hurt. His ugly words make new recruits on the internet. His words have haunted me much of my life, as had the vile statement that the Holocaust is something Jewish people brought on themselves. Thank you. So basically she's saying, why should Jewish people feel ashamed for hateful philosophies of, of Henry Ford specifically, but I'm assuming that in general as well. Um, in, in, in the previous lesson we talked about Bala Sulam's warnings. You know what? Let's, I think I have them here now. Give me a sec. Okay. Let's go to the slides. Let's go to slide number one. Here's, here's what Rav Kook, the first chief rabbi of Israel, writes I think he wrote this in 1907. Okay? Look at what he says. Um, and then you tell me what, what you think about the Holocaust. Okay? This is what he wrote in 1907. Come to the land of Israel. It, at the time it was Palestine, of course. We shall call out with a loud and terrible voice, with the sound of thunder, and a great voice, a voice that steers storm and quakes the heaven and the earth, a voice that tears every wall in the heart. Run for your lives and come to the land of Israel. The voice of the Lord is calling us. His hand is stretched out to us. His spirit is in our hearts, meaning the spirit of bestowal, of giving unity. And he assembles us, again, it's all about unity, encourages us and compels us all to call out loud with a terrible and mighty voice, our brothers, children of Israel, dear beloved brothers, come to the land of Israel. Go to slide number two. He continues, Assemble one by one. Wait not for formal words or, or orders. Wait not for permits from renowned ones. Do what you can. Flee and gather. Come to the land of Israel. Pave the way for our beloved and oppressed nation. Show it that its way is paved already, stretched out before it. It must not rest. It has nothing to demand. It has not many ways and routes. There is one way before it, and this is the one it shall march. It is the one it must march, specifically to the land of Israel. And at this point, <clears throat> um, he, he was also talking about how we shouldn't expect anything from the West uh, and that it's not going to be any better there. He died in 1935 before the Holocaust, but he saw what was coming. So we need to realize that in that sense, I suppose you could say that the Jews brought this on themselves. Of course, not intentionally, not knowingly, obviously. But we need to realize that all of the problems the Jews are suffering is because they are not doing, we are not doing what we must. You cannot blame anyone. It's the law of nature that when you have a dysfunctional element in the system, the system tries to fix it. And that element never feels good about it. It's never comfortable, it's never pleasant. And the harder the element resists, the harder means the system uses to correct it. So, I'm not saying Henry Ford was a Jew lover. He had a lot of bad things. If you read this book, you will see how much 
animosity, how much hatred he had for the Jews. But read at least those excer- excerpts. There are many more, actually, in the book. Um, similar to what I read now. And you'll see that he's not just hating the Jews, he's telling them what they have to do. It's one of the few anti-Semites who actually was thinking not just about how he hates Jews, but why he hates Jews. And we need to listen to what we are being told. And then things will be okay. Rav Yehuda Ashlag, author of the Sulam Commentary on the Zohar, wrote um, about this problem. He was actually trying to, um, to get the Jews out of Poland. We talked about it. Um, and he was excommunicated by the Jews. So he left for Israel, which was then Palestine, alone. And he is the only one out of the 300 families he originally gathered to come to Israel. He was the only one who survived because he didn't stay in Poland. Um, but he said, this is what will happen. Look what he writes. Look at slide number three. Barasulam, yeah, Barasulam uh, disputes the notion that Nazi Germany was a once-in-history event. It may have been the first, but he believed that unless we do what we must, it will not be the last. In his words, it turns out that people mistakenly think that Nazism is only an offshoot of Germany. All the nations are equal in that, and it is utterly futile to hope that the Nazis will perish with the victory of the Allies. For tomorrow, the Anglo-Saxons will embrace Nazism. And not, by Nazism, he, he, he also talks about fascism and, and every, every other form of, of fascism. But what he's saying here basically is just a warning that if we don't do what we must, we cannot expect anything good to come to us from the world because the world will demand us to do what we have to do. Um, and if we don't, it will consider us expendable. So, for the next lesson, try to do the workshop we talked about today and read chapter number seven. Mm-hmm. But especially, try to do the workshop if possible. Uh, and on this somber note, we move on to our announcements. Yep, so as you said, the next lesson, chapter number seven. Yeah, but, but, but I just, guys. Let's not be pessimistic, okay? Everything will be okay. We just have to do what we have to do. And then it'll happen. Okay. So, uh, next lesson, on the 30th of December, that's a Tuesday, that's a week from now, minus an hour and 15 minutes, we'll be do- doing the topic on contemporary anti-Semitism, the roots to, as to why anti-Semitism has increased by 30% in the past year. That's next week's topic. So you are surprised by it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Um, also, please like us on Facebook. Our moderator posted the link in the chat, so you can just copy it from there. It's, or you could just type bundle of reads in Facebook and you'll find it. So please like it and you'll get the updates and the video streams are going to be posted there as well. And there are discussions and you can ask questions there. So that's uh, Facebook, so please join. And in the follow-up email after this lesson, you'll get a link to the lesson itself. And if you want to ask questions, or if there are things that still remain unclear after the lesson, or if there are any points that you find that you feel are important that we address here in this course, then please just reply to that email with your question, comment, anything that you wanted to say. Impressions from the workshop. Impressions from the workshop, yes, exactly. And that's it. So thank you, Gilad. Thank you, Chaim. Thank you for being with us. And we hope to see you next week. And until then, stay cool. Think about what we all need to do. And uh, let's go ahead and do it. So until then, see you. Bye-bye.